Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see uh, uh, a good turnout for the session this afternoon. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Peter Deweys. I'm uh, the forest advisor at the World Bank, and I'm also the program manager for PROFOR, which is the program on forests. Uh, PROFOR is a, an, a, a program uh, hosted by the World Bank, which carries out analytic work, uh, supports partnerships, shoots blinding light in your eyes, <laughs> um, and uh, 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 supports analysis and partnerships and the development of tools, which are broadly meant for people and develop, the development practitioners with interest in forests. Um, while we're based at the bank, uh, we're not really part of the bank in, in a way. But uh, if you don't know Profor, I would encourage you to, uh, to dig into our website at profor.info. Um, and one of the reasons we're here today is because we work very closely with, with two sets of partners in particular. Uh, first, of course, C4, uh, the Center for International Forestry Research, and uh, also with IUCN. Uh, and we're funded partly through a window through, uh, from DFID, uh, which is funnily enough called No4. Um, I won't dwell on that too much, but uh, here we are. Um, and it, it's brought us together today to talk about how we impact policy change through knowledge. And this is a common challenge that all of these institutions and many of yours deal with. We tend to look at various problems from a research perspective. But if we really want to have an impact, we have to show how we can leverage policy change. And that really is a subject of the discussion today. So what we've done is we've brought a, a group of colleagues and friends to talk about how their own experience in developing uh, knowledge products and developing analysis has been used to leverage policy change and policy, uh, 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 a different policy outcome than one would normally have expected. Um, I'm going to start, uh, the, the way we're going to organize this, we're going to uh, give each of the panelists uh, five to ten minutes to talk about their particular case, their particular experience, uh, to give you a flavor of the kinds of challenges that we face in trying to leverage policy change through some of this type of these types of analytic studies and, and pieces of research and so on. Um, and then uh, at the end of that, we're going to be asking you some questions. And I'm going to turn that over. At that point, I'll turn over to a, to a facilitator to, to work that process through. But we really want your views about this, too, because we think in this room, there's a really rich body of experience of people who've had this, this challenge. How do you change policy? As, a, as an outcome of the kind of research and, and, uh, and experience that you, you've all collectively had. Um, the first panelist today is Maria Brockhaus. Maria is an economist and a policy analyst working on forestry and uh, agriculture sciences. She's worked at the interface of, of research and development, economics and policy in Anglo and Francophone countries in the Middle East and, and uh, West and Central Africa. Uh, she has a really sound practical experience in agriculture and forestry. Um, rural sociology and economics. And since 2009, uh, she's been leading the research on national Red Plus strategies and policies in C4's global comparative study. So, Maria, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. I think I will stand up because it's easier. I did bring a presentation, um, which should be the Warsaw, no, yeah, voila, as in it, yeah. And um, yeah, thanks, first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here a little bit. And um, I just got shown the time. Um, oh, what's the pointer? Um, and what I will do is I will explain a little bit what we are doing in C4 in this global comparative study on Red Plus. And I will use that as an example then to answer the following questions which we got as speakers here for this panel. So Peter was um, providing us with questions such as what makes knowledge generation and uptake successful? How well do we know what other people need to know? And also linked, I think, uh, what are some of the barriers to sharing knowledge and what kind of tools could help us to achieve that? And as I said, I will talk about CFOS Global Comparative Study and I guess some of you have heard about that already. The objective we have, this is a project since 2009 going on, and what we want to achieve is to support Red Plus policymakers, practitioners, the whole community with information, with analysis, with tools, guidelines, 
to ensure 3E outcomes. And 3E means to make sure that whatever kind of red plus will happen, that it is cost effective, uh, carbon effective, cost efficient, and also delivers on equity and delivers co-benefits. And uh, the way C4 is doing that, maybe some of you have seen that already, is um, we are working with four scientific um, with four scientific modules that try to generate the evidence we then want to disseminate with our fifth module, and I think we will hear from John more about that one, is this kind of very active, engaged knowledge sharing. But the evidence comes from a module that looks at national policies, a module that looks at demonstration sites, at project activities, a module that looks at MRV issues, which are cross-scale, and also at carbon management in the landscape, which we discovered was a gap in our earlier design. So we work in, here I'm saying 12 countries, but in fact now we are working in 13 countries all over the tropical world. And just to give you an example of knowledge outputs, because again, this whole session here is about knowledge, knowledge generation, knowledge dissemination. These are some global products C4 has produced coming out or guided by this global comparative study. And the Analyzing Red Book from 2012 is the latest, latest global one. But in my presentation, I will focus on a different type of knowledge product we have um, gotten out over the last yeah, three years now. And these are the so-called country profiles. And maybe some of you know them as well. So for the 13 countries, we have a process where we try to understand um, guided by, step by an established methodology to ensure comparability, we try to understand the context in, the, in which Red Plus is emerging. So we do look at um, drivers of deforestation. We try to understand the political economy behind it. We try to generate knowledge on institutional distributional aspects of Red Plus, but also existing in the country. So again, the whole question of in which context is Red Plus emerging? And what we do is we, we think these country profiles are quite successful. And we do think so because we have this download figures, and again, something John will maybe talk a bit more about. So we do have download figures. We understand that people really are keen on those country profiles, that they provide a knowledge. We get anecdotal evidence for there is knowledge that is useful in this whole policy and practitioner arena. Even though I have to say, unfortunately, <coughs> this is what a scientist would do, is you look up your um, citation. But policymakers do not reference, or rarely at least, very rarely. So still, we do have some evidence that these country profiles are quite successful and useful. And what we think is that the basis for this ex success are basically the, um, the engagement with national partners. So again, C4 is doing this um, global public goods at an international comparative level. But what we do is we engage with national partners who then are not only the ones who have access to gray literature, who have access, who are act actually actors in this kind of national policy arena, but they are also the ones who then carry this evidence they themselves have generated they carry this evidence exactly where it should be, and that is where the needs are in the national policy domain. And that means what we have with that, and you can ensure ownership, I think, is key. So there has to be ownership over these knowledge products in a respective country, otherwise you will not change anything, because you produce and your products, your knowledge will not reach. And the thing is that what I anticipated was that by engaging with national partners, we would have a full understanding of who is in the policy domain. But obviously also our partners, as well as C4, we operate, and many other organizations as well, we operate with the same set of partners often. And we think that our old contacts, our own networks are the ones that are relevant, but how updated are we? And the big question is what kind of tools do we have to verify that what we assume are the key partners, the boundary partners, are then in fact really the ones who are relevant. And what we did in this design for this global comparative study, and then I'm entering the second part of my presentation, is 
So we employed policy network analysis as a tool to understand, first of all, to identify <coughs> who are the actors in the policy domain. So the question was, who is considered as relevant by the other actors, but also by themselves as relevant for Red Plus as the policy arena? And we use policy network analysis also to identify, and those of you who are familiar with that method is, you can identify structural holes and you can identify brokers and bridges, which means what you have to envision is a network, a policy domain, <laughs> actors that are nodes, and then what you see in this, you can analyze those structures by understanding who is connected or who has which relationship with whom. So in fact, this policy network analysis is currently ongoing in eight countries. I should say that uh, we do have a special issue coming out on that rather soon. And uh, with papers from Brazil, Cameroon, Indonesia, Nepal, Peru, Papua, New Guinea, Tanzania, as well as Vietnam. And what we try to do there is to assess this kind of relational aspect. So what, what is the structure in this policy arena we are working with? Who should know what what is knowledgeable, who should know what we think are relevant is, is necessary evidence. And that brings me already basically to the end of this. Just to give you an example of some questions we were asking, so what are, who is involved in this national policy making, but also what are the networks of information and influence. And I brought with me a number of examples for this policy network stuff. And one is, for example, from Indonesia. What you see here is a typical bridge. And I should say, I think Moira, if you could wave quickly. So for people who have questions to policy network analysis in Indonesia, my colleague Moira Moliono should be here and can answer. Ah, there she is waving. Then I brought also Brazil. And I think Maria Fernanda Guevara can answer questions for that one. And Peru. I will skip, <laughs> and the most important part I have to say is, and then I really leave the floor, is this slide here. <laughs> <laughs> Just to understand, it's not only a policy network analysis we do, but these are national partners, these are individuals in the different countries, and without those, the whole work wouldn't be possible, obviously. So, thank you. Maria, thanks so much. Thanks very much, Maria. Uh, the second speaker today is, uh, is a good friend and a colleague, also with C4. Uh, John Comey is a director of communications, and one of the reasons why uh, the Global Landscape Forum happens at all is because of John's hard work that, that has gone into it. Um, he's spent more than 25 years working in Africa, Southeast, and, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, seven years as a senior researcher, 12 years as a foreign correspondent, worked for time for a while, has degrees in forestry and communications from the University of Minnesota in economic geography from the London School of Economics and in journalism from the Columbia University. So John, over to you. Thanks. Yes, that's it. We can start with the first one. I'm also going to stand up. Can we go to the beginning? Okay, I've been told I have seven minutes, so I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Um, I'm using the Global Landscape Forum as an example of a no for in action. This, uh, this uh, forum is actually supported by the no for project and working with World Bank and Oxford and our partners in IUCN and others. Um, I'm also going to show you our communication model, which came out of uh, the project that Maria was talking about. Uh, the model has been very successful. She was talking about downloads. By using this communication model, we have, in her case, one of those publications was downloaded over a million times. We've cut printing down by 75% and saved over $400,000 a year in printing and shipping using downloads. So I'm going to move through very quickly on the Landscape Forum and how we are building a communication program for policy impact around this forum. <coughs> first, I'm going to go back that when I first started in communication 25 years ago, this was the CGIAR communication model. 
And this is a 1998 uh, cover that was award-winning. And I always thought something was wrong with it. And over years, we start to see what's wrong with it because research starts in the middle, a uh, paper is produced, another paper is produced, and by the time it gets to policy, it can be eight years. It's a very, very long time, and even though at the time we thought that was very progressive. And uh, I'm going to say something. I'm really sensitive to the tragedy in the Philippines, but I don't know how to show my model without it. One day we were looking at Hurricane Katrina, and we said, what happens with communication? How does it move around the world? If you've got 2.3 million billion people, including 100 million, 150 million internet users in Africa, even though a lot of those in South Africa, etc., and this is the model that we produced out of it. Usually, I put C4 in here, but today I put Global <coughs> Landscape Forum. This model is uh, is like a hurricane. Impact is constant and and frequent. It's web-based, leveraging social social media. It combines with traditional outreach. It's very important. The traditional you can't forget that uh, if you look at President Obama, he's still reading the Washington Post. So traditional media is still very important, and a conference is still a traditional media. Um, and we leverage the conference to uh, build a program around it. We monitor it. We've been monitoring the data. I'm going to talk about some of that every week. And we've been monitoring the websites on GLF. We've been monitoring everyone that came on and where they came on from. We monitor everything about it. And we change as we see the, the data coming in. Um, so what do we do with the Landscape Forum? We started working on this about eight months ago. We thought, okay, like Forest Day, we can leverage the UNFCC uh, uh, Conference of Parties. We can leverage the power and communication assets of the 52 organizations involved. You think about FAO, IUCN, World Bank. Their communication assets are phenomenal. So what can we do if we get all those working together? And what happens when we have what we have now? We have over 2,000 people registered for this conference. We had 850 today going up to 900. We were only expecting 400. Tomorrow we expect we'll have 1,400. Every single individual coming. Now we get them doing Twitter and other things and spread the word. 120 speakers, all of those come from organizations. And 350 delegates. Like Forest Day, those delegates are where we, where we start to play uh, impact policy. And we're expecting 350 UNFCC delegates tomorrow. Um, we started a co communication campaign that started the DG wrote, if you might have seen, five or six blogs on landscapes and others. Uh, we leveraged the media presence and we leveraged the power of our uh, host country partner and this university itself, which is just such a fantastic place. <laughs> what were the challenges in this one? Landscapes is pretty complex. Uh, we weren't sure how it was going to go over. It's kind of intangible. It is silos. When I first went to the Minister of Forestry, they didn't want to work with the Ministry of Agriculture. This is not, a, you know, people aren't used to working together. And everybody said you could never succeed after Forest Day. Everything will fail after that. So that was a tough one. On the other hand, the opportunity was to connect new communities. And there's probably people in here. I've, I've went, done four Forest Days, and we saw everyone every year. We used to say hello. And we knew everybody by the fourth year. But now there's a whole new group of people. We're reaching out to all new people. It's very exciting. We're linking to the global issues more than just UNFCC, but SDGs. And uh, we're reaching into new stakeholder groups. We had one objective. Uh, you've seen that a lot. We're going to inform the UNFCC agreements. Agriculture, for example, is, is not in the agreement. Forestry, we succeeded, all of us together, uh, starting in Cancun. And, uh, and also uh, reach into the sustainable development goals that are happening right now. So we're leveraging that media attention and activity around those SDGs as well. We had a lot of new innovative uh, approaches. This website, we did something different. It's something we're doing new at C4. It's non-branded C4. It's not branded by C4. We have uh, at least seven organizations getting involved with it, 150 partners working on it. We found that if you don't brand it, other people were willing to come on, and you don't have to approve their work so much. So we're going to be doing more of that. It becomes more of a meeting place. Um, if you haven't heard of Paperly, you should. It's a new thing coming out. We develop research partners, I mean uh, media partners that help us and give us free access. So that was the website. Like I say, 150 partners. This has been one of our most successful websites in uh, over a month, 24,000 a week people visiting. That's a lot for a tiny little website in the middle of nowhere. Um, social media. And then we get the, the social media going that was around that. With Twitters, we reached 1,300,000 people, the Twitter reach, with uh, the group of people that were coming on board on the landscape. 
Uh, Paperly is create your own newspaper. Twitter chats, we did two or three very successful Twitter chats. We had Google group connecting, and we had, this is one of the things we do at all these conferences now. We do, here we did a boot camp. Sometimes we do media training. And then what you do is you do the boot camp. We have 60 on-site social reporters. We have an outstanding media trainer, social media trainer. And then we let them loose on the conference. We don't try to control them. We don't try to edit them. But you end up with a huge amount of information going out of the conference itself. And then we tap the, the uh, strength and, and encouragement and passion of the youth. So this was an experiment this time, the youth, uh, the youth session. And we had just a fantastic response. I mean, we, how many people? Uh, Michelle, who's also young, was the one that came up with this great idea and, and worked through. How many people applied to be speakers? 150 speakers, and we chose, no, and we chose 10. And there, we had 13,000 votes. It was a huge group of people that got involved in the Twitters and the attention. And now they're heavily involved with the conference. It's the first time we're going to start doing that every time now to have a youth session. Um, oh, sorry. So this is the last slide. What do we do with all this? Landscapes.org was our original idea. On Monday, we're going to transition the conference website into landscapes.org. I'm going to go to every, all the 57 uh, organizations, and I'm going to ask them to participate in the website itself and keep it going on its own. So this will now be a media platform. That's why I bought landscapes.org for this subject. And we'll be able to reach lots of different groups. And we'll be inviting others to put their blogs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's what I've got. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks very much, John. That's uh, that's great. It's um, uh, always always uh, it takes my breath away when I see kind of how you're reaching out and the footprint that you've got in in um, in the internet and and elsewhere. Uh, uh, it's it's a really interesting story. I want to turn out turn out to uh, another old friend, Joel Petrikowski, who's with the Biodiversity Institute at the University of Oxford. She's also working closely with C4 on a on an interesting uh, initiative, uh, which focuses on the quality of evidence for science policy dialogue and for constructing uh, relevant research agendas. Um, she is leading a collaborative project, uh, partly coordinated by C4, uh, to use information management to extend stakeholder engagement mechanisms to identify policy priorities and for science and to improve the quality of science for policy. And here, I mean, this is a, a particularly resonant uh, question for us in the World Bank. Uh, as some of you know, we've had a new president now. He's been in place for about a year and a half. And one of the first things he said to us when he, when he took over that position, he said, you know, you guys are supporting development work. I want to make sure that it's evidence-based. And so the importance of evidence, the kind of, kind of work that Joel is working on in terms of generating evidence to inform development outcomes, to inform policy, it's hugely important and, and very much re resonant with my own institution. Over to you, Joel. Thanks. Thank you very much for that nice uh, introduction, Peter. It's always horrible to have to follow John because John's message is so exciting. And in fact, at the heart of my work, the systematic reviews is very careful, quiet, sitting in a library, being somewhat dull. But uh, nonetheless, uh, as Peter says, I believe it's uh, exciting. I'm passionate about it, but so, so, so let's go. Um, as Peter says, I'm now actually in the long-term ecology and resource stewardship group. And our evidence base comes from such things as pollen cores from lake sediments and ice cores going back into the paleo. So we really do believe in very long-term data sets, um, which might become apparent uh, as I go through some of the things that I'm talking about. Thanks very much, C4, for the opportunity of uh, participating in this session. It's great, and it's great that it's so full. Okay, I saw this uh, slide recently. A lot of you have seen it. It's a fantastic little um, graphic on how to influence uh, negotiators. Um, all good stuff. What worried me to a certain extent was this little bit over here. It, it's good advice, get, to, get, get, get up to, to speed on data and facts, use infographics and so on, way before you reach the stage of actually being loud and blogging and tweeting and all the sorts of cool things that John's just been talking about. Um, the boring thing for me, the boring worry that I have, I suppose, is I would want to say what facts, what data, how reliable are they, and what are you doing about the bias inherent in those sources? So that's the kind of the policy context, the influence that I worry about and that I, I, my research kind of deals with, um, just those four questions to a certain extent.
because I see the, the landscape of, of this, uh, this, this discussion being here encapsulated in this diagram. Um, the policy context knowledge, the knowledge that we're using to influence policy. So it can be good information, great information, well collected. It can be poor information. And then it can be really well done. It can be, it can be done effectively and engagingly in the way that John and his team do. Or it could be done, it could be presented rather poorly. Bottom line, bad information presented poorly, not such a problem. Good information, great information presented well is great. It's what we're all aiming for. And again, I have this worry about the really poor information that looks rather good and looks influential and is often the stuff that policymakers might grab at. So that's the context that we're working in um, to try and solve some of those challenges. And the other context, as, as has been alluded to in the last few speakers, is that policy is now really in this bigger picture game. This is a slide that Peter Holmgren, DG of C4, has been using a lot this summer very effectively. It's, uh, it's describing how forestry now sits outside its own little domain. It has to interact with these other very important um, policy arenas. So we've got to do something that, that, that tackles poor information or bad use of information and, and, and is outside our comfort zone, perhaps, and, and how we, we're going to be tackling that. Now, the medics, with their enormously broad topic set, um, uh, networks, came up 20 years ago with something that they called evidence-based medicine. Some people don't like the term. Uh, evidence-informed medicine is, is, is a nice term and perhaps one that I prefer myself. And we thought perhaps we can, we can look at how this might work in forestry. And it's reasonably simple. It's getting together the best science that you possibly can those people who are involved on the ground and have real expertise in working with communities or something, people like Maria and so on and others here, and society's needs and preferences, because what science says does not in a linear way necessarily feed into what we're going to do for society. So in the middle sits evidence-based medicine in the medical field and we hope will fit evidence-informed forestry. So that's the model that we tried to build on. And there are many, many uh, long-standing ex successful examples of this being used in other fields, not just medicine. So we've drawn on all the, um, the, the great information and resources and experiences in these other, other areas. And C4 has led a, a coalition, if you like, of collaboration with these partners here that you can see, with uh, DFID funding, generous funding, we've actually started to explore how evidence-based forestry systematic reviews might play out in our fields. So the current um, desire, I suppose, of this program is, is mainly to conduct systematic reviews, and I'll tell you a little bit about those in a moment, but also importantly to get people talking together in that collaborative three-circle model that I spoke about earlier to identify good questions for reviews and good policy where we need good policy uh, to be developed. So these things work outside just the systematic review and also to promote good practice so that we're not constantly doing that bottom left to top right poor information used rather attractively kind of model. So that's where we are looking at very broad types of questions with complex landscapes and perhaps rather narrow questions about sort of methods of measuring things in our traditional forest domains. All of these scales are, are able to be tackled in, in the program. So really the systematic review uh, sits in that s circle of best science, but it itself is, is collected using a collaborative approach. So although it, it informs good science, it is done with a lot of stakeholders. It's not just talking to your best friends and coming up with the best papers, which happen to be mine or Peter's and nobody else's. It's a real attempt to be broad and collaborative and inclusive. And it has, it has a very strict methodology, which I won't go into too much today because I've only got six minutes or, 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 or fewer. So, but it's a three-stage process, really. Define the question. Is that an important question that policymakers want? Do we have enough uh, evidence, uh, scientific papers and others, to support such a question? If we have, let's, uh, let's review it. And let's review it in a very thorough, uh, comprehensive, transparent and reliable way, repeatable way. And it's set up exactly like uh, a scientific project would be, with a good method, uh, a method that's peer-reviewed, then the results are looked at, that's peer-reviewed, then the conclusions are drawn, that's peer-reviewed. So it's set up, although it's a slightly dull narrow review sitting in a library looking at 
published literature and other forms of evidence. It is set up as a scientific experiment in that sense. It is, it's, a, it's a scientific approach to literature review. It's as, almost as simple as that. And then very importantly, particularly in the context of this session, is this wider engagement uh, um, and s sending your results out using such tools as, as John's got, uh, available through C4 and, and other um, important, influential, relevant uh, fora that speak to the audiences that you want to reach. Um, I won't go into great detail about the stages, but perhaps people who are interested can talk to me later. These slides will be available anyway, and we might want to get into some discussions uh, around our tables. But essentially, those are the steps of a systematic review. As I say, they're like a, a scientific experiment where you go through in a very, very um, ri ri rigorous way. And there's slightly shorter versions of these called systematic maps, which are rather exciting. We're starting to, to look at those, where you just concentrate on those first six stages. And these can be also very powerful tools to tell policymakers how much information is there out there in the question that you're interested in, and what kind of quality is it? So that, that, that there's a kind of um, landscape, if you like, of, of the research and other evidence in your field. So good progress in the 12 months since we've been up and running. Lots of systematic reviews are up and running. We've got a, a steering committee with our partners um, uh, keeping us on track, if you like, and, and trying to, it's not really keeping us on track. I don't know why I said that. It's trying to, to di discover together what we might want out of this. So it's, it's very open early days, really, and we're being guided by these other initiatives, but not bound by them. This is something we'll have to find out for ourselves in the forestry and landscape community. Um, I'd urge you to look at the website that's hosted by C4. It's a nice little website, lots of, of stuff on it. We've just had a call for new proposals for, for systematic reviews. Some of you in the room may have submitted some. I hope so. Some fantastic ideas came through and we'll be choosing some new topics later. These are the existing topics which I'll leave on the, on the slides for you to look at later. But you can see, just looking at this, it's a very wide spread of questions which have policy relevance, they have plenty of literature that will inform them, and they're, they're pretty interesting to do. So those are the kinds of questions we'll look at, but we're looking at uh, different scales, different types of question which will inform different policy arenas. So there's more work being done. Um, you can get involved. We'll be announcing something called T20Q quite soon, which will be a collaborative bottom-up way of asking you what you think are the most important policy and review questions. Um, and we'll be rolling that out, I think, in January, February, and perhaps launching it in March if we can get up and running. And we're really hoping to have the Delphi phase of this, where people have collected all these exciting ideas that come in through um, internet... Uh, personal contact and workshop um, situations and a Delphi group of people who will look at those and, and push them back out to the community we hope will be sitting in Salt Lake City connected with the Euphro Congress which, which seems like a very good broadish uh, arena for, for us to make those decisions but this will be announced please do keep an eye on the C4 webpage we'll reach you because John knows who you are John knows who everybody is and with his incredible databases and those of the partner organizations, we really are interested in reaching out to as many people as we possibly can to find out what you think are the important questions um, in the way that the youth session did. So that's it. That's the web page. Um, the questions that were uh, on the tables for you to discuss later, I truly believe that the systematic review approach speaks to all of those questions in one way or another. So I would urge you to uh, ask questions, uh, throw out some ideas, and engage with that idea when we, when we sit around the tables later. And if there are any particular questions about the process, I realize I've covered it in very quickly, and there's a great deal of detail that I haven't said. Just grab me at some point today or tomorrow. And thank you very much indeed for listening. Thanks very much, Joel. Um, we're going to turn now to two uh, very interesting cases of how uh, research has helped inform, um, inform policy. And I want to start by saying, uh, talking a little bit about some work that Proforce supported uh, a couple of years ago, with working with the Global Partnership for Forest Landscape Restoration. Uh, the GPFLR uh, uh, commissioned a study 
looking at the potential for restoring degraded landscapes um, through, through reforestation, through afforestation, farmer managed natural regeneration, and so on. And that mapping process, or that process generated a map, a global map, uh, which identified somewhere around 2 billion hectares of land uh, globally, which could be restored through these, th through these types of measures. And what was interesting about the map was it, it kind of conveyed the message. It got a very high profile when it came out. It conveyed the big picture message. We have 2 billion hectares out there we should be able to do something with. But the practical question after that was, well, so what do we do about it at the country level? And how do we inform policy at the country level to bring landscape restoration much more fully into the policy framework? And as an outcome of that discussion, uh, uh, Profor working with IUCN, uh, IUCN with support from Profor, uh, financed the preparation of a national assessment of the potential for landscape restoration in Ghana. And the idea was to develop some tools about how you would go, go about doing these types of assessments to identify the specific locations where uh, landscapes could be restored and so on. And uh, that tool now is being rolled out in a serious way globally with IUCN, uh, partly funded by, by DFID through NOFOR. And uh, the next two speakers will be talking a little bit about uh, how they've been working with the landscape restoration assessments. Um, the first speaker is uh, Andrea Nahara Achevedo, who holds a bachelor's degree in biology from the University, uh, Universidad del Valle de Guatemala. She has a master's of, of science in ecology and a master's in political science as well. Uh, she holds a conservation biology professor position and today is managing the uh, strategic ecosystems conservation program at the National Forest Institute in Guatemala. So, Andrea, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm going to present um, the potential for restoration of forest landscapes in Guatemala and its impacts on national and regional policy. This is an example of how uh, to link like science and policymakers. So um, first of all, Guatemala, and that is Guatemala, um, we have 34% of the country with forest cover. That means 3.7 million hectares, approximately, as in 2010. And more than 146,000 hectares of forests have been lost between 2006 and 2010. That is a high risk. And the rate, excuse me, the rate is approximately 3,800,000 uh, hectares per year. That is like very, a lot of hectares lost each year. And that makes that the country has a great potential for restoration, unfortunately, because we have a lot of deforestation, we have a great potential for restoration. Uh, Guatemala has signed international conventions that include restoration targets that should be met. For example, the Bond Challenge, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, etc. Also, national policies make it mandatory too. For example, the Constitution, the Forestry Law, the law on protected areas and the bio biodiversity policy make it mandatory to restore degraded areas. So what have we done in Guatemala? And here are the, the three examples that I want to show you, uh, the way in which we fill that gap between science and policy, or we try to fill it. <laughs> um, first of all, there is an interest in recovering degraded areas in the whole country. Second, or maybe the, the first example, is the economic incentives for reforestation that have been uh, started since a few years ago by the, my institution, the Inst Institute of National Forestry. Second is the map of potential areas for reforestation. And third of all is the national strategy for forest landscape restoration, which is in process right now. So I'm going to go through these three examples. The first of all is the economic incentives for reforestation. My institution, since 1998, I'm sorry, um, since 1998, gives incentives for reforestation and restoration. Uh, the name of the program is PINFOR, which means Forestry Incentives Program. Uh, in 15 years, more than 112,000 hectares have been reforested 
from 1998 to 2012. This program goes on right now. So we don't have the data for 2013. Uh, more than 149.2 million has been the amount of the incentive or the investment that the government of Guatemala has made in this reforestation and natural regeneration. Uh, there have been approximately 335,000 recipients. Uh, that means uh, people that had received those incentives for keeping their land reforested or let it restore. The second program is called PIMPEP. It is mean incentives program for small landholders. That is the difference between the previous program. PIMFOR is for great landowners and PIMPEP is for small landholders. Uh, this program is more recent. Uh, it has been from 2007 until now. It's still going on. And it has been uh, 2,792 hectares were forested in these six years. The amount of the incentives has been 2.0 million of dollars. And this includes reforestation, agroforestry, and this amount of recipients. This is the second program that the government of Guatemala has implemented to uh, promote reforestation and natural re regeneration. Um, this, both programs have been created by, first of all, knowing the natural landscapes, the ecosystems, the degraded ecosystems, etc. So that is uh, an important thing. Uh, this is the, the summary of the two programs, PINFOR and PIMPEP the reforested area, the incentive or the investment in reforestation and restoration, and the number of recipients that has been uh, from these two programs. The second thing I want to present you, or the example, is the map of potential areas for reforest restoration and the criteria we used. First of all, uh, there are three cr criteria. The first one was areas without forest, excluding intensive agriculture, for example, sugarcane or watermelon, which are like extensive, very extensive in Guatemala and intensive. It includes agroforestry, forest landscapes for production, forest landscapes for conservation, for example, in protected areas, and silvopastoral systems. Uh, the second criteria is riparian forests and lakes. Uh, we have a buffer from 50 to 100 meters in rivers and lakes. And the third criteria is mangrove, areas deforested between 2008 and 2012. So these are the three uh, criteria that we use to create this uh, restoration map. And here it is. Um, this is still on work. I mean, it's not uh, national approved yet, but it's, it's ongoing. And here you can see in green all the, the areas potential for restoration. This is, I mean, this is a very useful instrument for us in Guatemala because it shows potential donors or potential um, scientists where we need their help. We need help, for example, in riverine forests, in mangrove areas, in wetlands, in agroforestry systems, in silvopastoral systems, in forest for production and forest for conservation. They can work or help us work outside protected areas, inside protected areas, etc. These are the proposed areas for restoration. I just told you uh, which them were. And in total, we have more than 3 million hectares as potential for restoration. You can see here the percentage of the total of, of, um, of land available um, and the, the types of, of uh, uh, things I just told you. The third example is, I mean, the incentives that I just told you and the map are like um, ingredients or main, main things so that we can start yet in Guatemala the National Forest Landscape Restoration Strategy. This is a, a process which has been very participatory, including national institutions, NGOs, international cooperation agencies, municipalities, civil society and academy. We are building this strategy right now using the map, using the incentives, uh, using private sector, I mean participating in private sector, etc. The strategy should be finished by 2014, next year, hopefully. Um, and the impacts on, on regional and national policy that all, has, all this has. 
First of all, it is a national interest. The, the actual government uh, has one of the working spheres uh, regarding uh, forestry, uh, recovery, recovery of forests uh, that have been degraded, etc. Uh, the recovery of degraded ecosystems uh, has, of course, environmental goods and services uh, that ha will be provided to the people, protection of biological diversity, carbon capture, and all this will uh, entail poverty reduction, improvement of food security, mitigation of climate change, incentives for investments, community participation, and information for decision making. This is exactly what we want to show you, that through science, uh, I mean knowledge generated by scientists, we can inform policymakers. we have made the incentives, the, the two programs that I just told you, the MAP, and also the National uh, Forest Landscape Restoration Strategy. So um, that is what we want to, to keep on going with this uh, with these goals. Um, the conclusion and challenges for Guatemala is, well, as I told you, we have uh, more than 3.5 million hectares available for restoration. Uh, many of them are in poverty zones or vulnerable areas of the country, especially. Um, the question that we have in the country or in the institution is how we will pay for these restoration actions in Guatemala. Of course, the government is very interested, NGOs, communities, but the idea, one of the ideas that we have, we have uh, is that uh, we have to create sustainable business models. Restoration should become a benefit through ecosystems, goods and services for the communities and the government and not a cost. That is the idea that we have. We need to pay this uh, restoration or we want to pay this restoration because of all the benefits that I just showed you in the previous slide. But we don't, have it, we don't want it to become a cost. We want to become a, a benefit for the communities, for the government, for all the people. Um, the thing is that private investments are possible and in some point necessary too. We maybe can't do it alone, only the government and communities and academy. We just, we want the private sector to be involved. There are good examples for, uh, from the sugarcane owners that they uh, have been investment, investing in, in these restoration actions. And at last, the national commitment and external cooperation are necessary in Guatemala. We fortunately count with support from, from international organizations. The government, as I told you, is very interested, is one of the working spheres of the current government. And so are, uh, we are very, very excited about future outcomes. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was really interesting. I really like this convergence of interests around landscape restoration, uh, development, uh, the issue of financing, and how the different tools have been mobilized to, to bring a different outcome uh, to bear. Um, the last speaker uh, today is uh, Enrique Munoz Lopez. He uh, holds degrees in geography from the School of Geography at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, from 1995 to 2012, he served as Chief Manager of Geographic Information Systems at the National Commission for Knowledge and, and the Use of Biodiversity. And it, he's now the Coordinator of Spatial Analysis uh, in the Bio Biological Corridors Department in the National Commission for Biodiversity in Mexico. So, en Enrique, uh, over to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to show them my presentation in seven minutes or less. <laughs> This is the original title for the project, and we we was uh, working in a special objective. Like we will, uh, I would like to show the topics about the, this presentation: the international programs, the background objectives, methodology, results, national level. This is a special uh, 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 term, and regional level conclusion uh, and the, the available on the website. We are working with the, the different uh, institutions in the international programs. Uh, this project was possible for, by IUCN and we are working in the different uh, projects, um, mainly in the sustainable production systems and RED plus program uh, for management and support of the RED and advanced rate. 
Now this is the objective, general objective. The, the challenge is uh, uh, to identify, it, identify the, the space for restoration, the forest restoration. The objective was to uh, identify potential areas to implement initiatives of forest landscape restoration in Mexico. The information generated use a, as a tool to manage local international financial resources to wide restoration efforts. In, in that uh, picture, uh, we, we were in the, in the place in order to verify the information about the model that in the next uh, slide explained the, the model. The model was in the uh, create with these these uh, topics the defined criteria, gathering information or collect information with different institutions, data process evaluation multi criteria with different experts in the different organization, join in the <coughs> workshop and define the, the the criteria in order to put the integrate the values in each map uh, and mapping. First, define criteria. We, um, in the workshop participatory process with institutional actors, more or less trade uh, professional to define ecological, economical, and social criteria. And, and then gathering information, working with another institution, mainly with the um, official institution in Mexico about the, the geography and the statistics. Uh, the idea was to collect all the information because if you have the, the, the information, it's very easy to uh, model the, 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 in the project. But if you don't have the, the information, the information you have problems with this. And that is the, the main, the main uh, information. For example, the, we uh, were processed the forest zoning for the National Commission Forests in three levels, high, medium, and, and slow. And then the forestry rigs. This uh, includes the different uh, social impacts for humans, the potential and real land use. This is the special uh, variable because we uh, use only the high rigs to water extraction. And then the erosion rigs. What is the, the main soil, soils with the different uh, problems like uh, according with the erosion? And this is the, the next uh, variables. Uh, level of preservation vegetation. Vegetation, primary vegetation or natural vegetation, and five resilience. Each uh, vegetation has a value for resilience or of the five. Cloud forest. It is important uh, element in, in Mexico because it's a special vegetation uh, in, in Mexico. We only we have uh, small areas in Mexico with a huge biodiversity in, in there. This is the, the, the model in three, in three sentences. Cartographic overlay process in geography, the, the first time with GIS, uh, values in, for reclassification final, waiting the, 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 put the, the information in, in each map, adding map with a most fragile ecosystem like the uh, cloud forest. And then when you combine this information and put the value, obtain the Cartographic, and this is the final result in, in Mexico. The, the suggested surface for forest landscape restoration is 13% the country of the country. And you, you can see different levels. In, the, in red is the high level for attention to reforestation, landscape forests, and medium and, and low in the, in the yellow uh, color. <coughs> Now, in order to verify the model, we, we were uh, uh, in, in that place in Chiapas State because in that place we, we have the different organization that we were working with, with them. <coughs> this is the, the, the model. When you have the, the, the model, in the, for example, in Mexico, it's very big in Mexico, you need 
verify the information. And the, the, the red colors, like, this is the, the results, the high and medium and low for the landscape restoration and with the classification land use. What happens when you uh, put the information over the land classification? We verify the, the information uh, about, in order to verify the, this point, obviously we need to uh, define the variables when you are working in the, in the level in the different scale, like the particular scale with with this. <clears throat> when you obtain the information, the, the idea was to put this information available for all the people. And this is, this is a, a, a essential that the information for, for priority potential site for restoration. The map is a good reference tool for future work in conjunction with other institutions involved in forest resources in Mexico. Um, it shows the potential of information management technology and modeling geographic space to address complex problems uh, uh, of land use. Um, when the information is available, it's easy to, uh, to compare with different organizations uh, in order to take the decision or make decision for support some projects or, or combine this. For example, you can uh, combine with ecoregions in Mexico or the areas of important beach conservations, priority terrestrial regions, priority hydrological regions. When you combine this and you can, uh, uh, you can uh, put the, the, this information and you can see the, the relation with biodiversity. For example, with this uh, information, this is the, the same process, more or less the same process with the landscape reforestation. reforestation. And then yesterday was integrate these maps available on the, on the website of Conavio. And let me show the address. This is the, the, the map now available in, in, in Conavio. More or less, Conavio has almost 4,000 maps available in, in Conavio. The idea is to combine this information with any, any, any maps that, uh, that you need to analyze, for example, with the biodiversity species. If you choose any species with uh, landscape reforestation, it's a... Uh, you have an idea in order to support some uh, projects or some uh, 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 spaces in, in Mexico. Now you can download this uh, map with metadata, geographic metadata, and you can uh, obtain with, the, with a link the methodology, all the methodology that was created this, this map. <coughs> and uh, the end, I think this is the last slide. Oh, this is the, the, the website. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Enrique. That's uh, also a, a really uh, uh, very interesting example. Both Guatemala and Mexico I find really fascinating in terms of how this kind of analysis is being used to inform investment. Um, you know, you, you start with a demand for better information about where you need to bring landscapes back into productivity, and then you use technology and mapping exercises to help you do that, and then you, you, you know, move the, the investment in those directions. Um, I'm going to invite my colleague, Vanda Santos, to, to, uh, to take the next, uh, the next role uh, for the session. She's a knowledge sharing officer at C4, and before that, uh, she's only been at C4 since September, and before that, she was at FAO as an information officer. She holds a PhD in information management from the University of Madrid, and is an information expert focused on knowledge management, knowledge sharing, communication, liaison, capacity development, and outreach. And she's going to help us kind of tease out some of the questions that we've already posed to you. So, Vlanda, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. 
I'm trying to figure out how we're going to do that, and we're going to do it together. <laughs> we're going to break into groups, because the idea is you have the opportunity to talk to the speakers and, and interact with them, but instead of it being in a plenary, you're going to do it in a small groups. So we're going to break into groups of seven people. And the idea is that you can move your chairs and get a group of seven people. We're going to have four questions that we're going to discuss in these groups. And those questions will be, each group will discuss one question and then we'll move to the other group to discuss in the next questions. So we will have 40 minutes to discuss four questions and also to interact to each other to try to do a knowledge sharing. I think we get a lot of information in this room, a lot of knowledge in this room, and this will be the great opportunity for you to talk to each other. So please, can you get seven people together and start talking. I, okay, let's do it this way. I'm going to start here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. No, it needs, it needs to be, I'm going to do, it's four groups that's going to discuss four questions. And we will have many, many groups that we need that will discuss question one, question two, question three, question four. Okay, so let's try to do it together. Again, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, to the lady with the computer, hello. One, two, three, four. You are one, two, three, four. Again, one, two, three, four. So what is gonna happen is all the ones will get together up to seven people. All the twos will get together up to seven people. Are you with me? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then you can grab your lunch and just get to the group. Tell me. Okay. Yes, I will. But I, yeah, but we need uh, first to get the group. One, two, oh, you already found it. Okay, okay, so one, two, three. Are you staying or are you leaving? Okay, record it's the wrong slide behind you.
you make sure that the research you're producing resonates with the people it needs to? Thinking that we know what stakeholders want and that actually is determining. So, beginning of the discussion. So, yeah, we're keen to know what, you know, how do you guys think you determine what stakeholders that you're trying to address need to know? That's Agent Yona. Is there any? No. So, I mean, I just, I mean, I think it's a really difficult question. You know, I mean, often we don't know what other people want to do. How, uh, how well do we know? 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 I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to know how to know who to speak to. Unless you know who is engaged in the questions and who is asking the questions. So, we can ask them. Yeah. We can ask them. Make sure you Yeah, might not get the answer. They expect So when you participate in meetings and where they identify these gaps and then you, you come up with like important issues. <laughs> Um, so it's suggesting what trying to um, group to different sort of economic scales. Um, so a small research organization trying to communicate with a large uh, company. Maybe one point, this is very time. Or some of the So, uh, to, rather than to ask everybody to, to kind of uh, get back in the lines of chairs, uh, I think what we'll do is just go very quickly around each of the four groups 
and ask if you can make just two key points that came out of the discussion. You know, and it, it's very hard. So that's why there's a rapporteur in each group. Uh, pick one or two points, key messages that you'd like to be conveyed through this process because we're going to try and summarize some of these points uh, going forward. And then I'm going to ask a colleague from, um, from DFID, Katrina, to make a few closing comments. So uh, where shall we start? Um, Floor, are you ready? Uh, okay, who has question one? <laughs> okay, let's do, go ahead. Okay, I, I win. Um, <laughs> two key points. Okay, I was, the, the question was um, making knowledge generation and uptake successful. So two key points are that the, the people who are going to make use of the knowledge need to generate a, a common language with the people who are developing that so that they're able to articulate their, their requirements effectively. And the second key point, after half a point, which is we need effective dissemination back, but also that um, as researchers, we shouldn't only be guided by, by those requirements. And often it's the role of researchers to, to challenge the, the existing uh, requirements and states of knowledge as well. So that introduces new sets of challenges, but it's not something that should be ignored. It's the role of critical research in that cycle as well. Very excellent. Thank you. Question two. Okay. Um, uh, question two was, uh, what are some of the barriers to sharing knowledge about landscapes? And that's missing from up there, about the landscapes. But I'd say the first one is, well, what is a landscape? And then uh, a lot of confusion about, perhaps it's, a, it's as, a, as a concept, as there's some immaturity, though my colleague sitting next to me right here says, no, he's been working on it for 40 years. So maybe not. Um, challenge of, of labeling it. Is it necessary to label it? Um, it is, there, is it necessary to have a, a common label of what, of, and a common understanding of, of what a landscape is? Um, another issue that we touched on was um, sort of the political economy of, of knowledge so, uh, as a barrier. So uh, for example, you'd ha uh, the challenge that a small um, NGO has in communicating um, with a, a large palm oil plantation company, for example. A indigenous group, the challenge an indigenous group has communicating with a large research organization. Um, and then one other one I'll just touch on is, is a willingness to, to share knowledge. Um, some organizations seem very willing to do it and, and others less so. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Question three, floor. Question three ah. is over here, oh, really? uh, which yes. we define as the difficult question. How well do we know what other people need to know? So. This is a question of defining our audience. And what the discussions really came out with was um, it needs to be a participatory and, and iterative feedback process. So, you know, often people don't necessarily know who their audiences are when they start out the research question, and there needs to be definitely a, a, a commitment to, to figuring out who the audience is, what they're interested in, and, and what the knowledge gaps are so that the, the research is relevant to that, to those questions. But it's also important that um, you know, there's no preconceived idea of what we think um, others need to know and, and we, that we think we know who our audience already is. And that was mentioned by, um, by Moira, actually, that you know, often people go to workshops and they think that um, you know, they're engaging with the right audience, but it might take them a couple of years to realise, actually, that's not the real audience at all. So um, being open and um, making sure that we, we are aware of our assumptions that we, when we assume who our audiences are. Great, thanks. And question four. Uh, a little bit of overlap with question three. Uh, two, two key messages. One, uh, similarly, understand your audience using different tools like uh, scoping, exercise, network analysis, working your uh, contacts in ministries, going to government workshops, being proactive. Um, also using different methods to talk to different members of the community. For example, women might require different listening um, strategies in some communities. And then uh, uh, phase two in uh, designing effective products is being able to translate and retranslate and reinterpret what um, 
knowledge you want to pass on in different formats, different media, combining online and on life, which is uh, offline jumbled, but uh, uh, very important in some, well, still today, it, there's a sense that uh, knowledge networks that only, and knowledge products that only exist online are not as effective as um, knowledge that's carried through face-to-face -face workshops and um, uh, radio and some communities, paper is even not that effective. So really uh, translating and spreading the word personally can help that way. Great, thanks very much. Um, we are going to save all of these and try and make some sense out of them. So I, I don't think we, we, we don't want to lose the richne richness of the discussion. Um, I want to ask Katrina if she could make just a few quick comments, and then we'll close up. Hi. Um, well, firstly, I'd just like to thank everyone for their participation, and especially the speakers. Um, we gave some really interesting presentations, and I think that we've referred to them as well within our, in our groups. And um, I think that we're at a time now where um, knowledge and evidence is really critical, especially coming from a donor perspective, where we, we need we need this to go forward with our programming. Um, and that's why a different, you know, really supportive of these initiatives and, 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 and the work of Profor and um, the other speakers as well. Um, so I, I just really want to say that um, thanks to everyone for participating. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to use the outputs from this, um, as Peter was saying, with um, the landscapes. Was, I think maybe it wasn't Peter actually, sorry, <laughs> was mentioning that we're going to use the outputs um, and have uh, all this kind of knowledge that we've all been learning from and sharing with each other and put that out in, in, uh, after this event. So, um, yeah, I think thanks everyone for participating. It's been great. Thanks so much, and, and thanks uh, also to Diffid for uh, being so supportive uh, of NOFOR and the, and the team. So with that, I'd like to bring this to closure, and I'd like to express my thanks to the panelists uh, and also to everyone who stayed. You know, it always impresses me when uh, you have a group of people who are really interested in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a question, a series of questions, they make it work. And that's what you've done tonight. So we really appreciate that. It's, it's a, a really uh, very uh, interesting and useful event for us. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy uh, uh, your evening and tomorrow as well. Thanks very much.